Hi, everyone. Thank <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Libby Reinish. I'm program coordinator at Free Press, and I'm really excited to have been invited to be a part of this session today. Um, I'm most of what I do at Field Press at Free Press is field organizing and working with uh, local communities to help them uh, improve the media in their communities and also to work with us on policy change on the federal level. So I'm really excited that uh, we may have a new Boston um, local media reform network that we can partner with and work with on some of our uh, mutual interests. So uh, thanks for being here. Um, I just wanted to, you know, say a, a, a little bit about why I think uh, this work is so so important. I don't know how many of you were at the uh, opening plenary last night. Did you all attend the opening plenary? Um, Malkia Cyril from the Center for Media Justice, I thought her remarks were really important, you know, and she was talking about needing a new kind of merger, which, which really just amounts to stronger alliances between uh, organizations working on these issues. And um, so I just kind of want to underscore the importance not only of, of identifying local issues that need to be addressed and working locally and building a movement locally, but then also the way that you can then take that strength and combine it with other folks working locally all over the country to amplify our voices and create something really powerful that can really impact change on the federal level. You know, so, so many of these local issues are shared by many communities across the country. And I think also you find that you are in, you're sort of invoking a lot of the problems that, that face communities, for example, let's say uh, lack of access to high-speed internet connections, which is a big problem where I live in Western Massachusetts. <laughs> um, you don't get very far with trying to, trying to make change maybe in your, with, your, with your local government, you're invoking federal policies. So we do need to work together to um, cultivate our local leaders, who can then help cultivate our our regional, you know, and national representatives to educate them on these issues and get them uh, representing what what the people want to see happening. So, um, I really hope that this this moment here at I think my mic went off. Um, it's not, okay. Great. Um, uh, I, I hope that this this opportunity having the National Conference for Media Reform here in Boston this year can help to galvanize the mov movement for media reform in Boston. And I hope that you'll continue uh, the relationship with Free Press that's sort of st starting here be beyond the conference and that we can work together. I just want to um, mention Let's see, just a couple of ways that that can that happen. I mean, I think, as I was getting at before, um, we, we really need people to be developing relationships with their representatives. You know, we can't do anything on the federal level if members of Congress don't feel that their constituents care about these issues. So we need people, you know, holding in district meetings with their representatives, letting them know why these issues are so important to them. Another thing that Jason and I were talking about earlier is the importance of having good data and good information coming out of uh, different locations across the country because we, c we do a lot of research at Free Press, but, but it's not always locally focused. And if you are doing, you know, if you can map your local media landscape, if you can identify in numerical terms and also anecdotally some of the real uh, problems and challenges that you're facing and propose solutions that can help us take that information to people at the FCC and, and members of Congress to try to not only identify st good strategies, smart policy recommendations, but also to back up our, our current arguments and our current recommendations. Um, and 
And then, of course, there's the extremely important work of movement building <laughs> locally and just, you know, evangelizing and spreading the word to members of your community and working across movements within the Boston community, you know, bringing in local artists and environmental groups and social justice organizations and youth organizations. And I think that a lot of those organizations are probably represented in the room today, which is extremely important. It's so important because, you know, we always say <laughs> whatever your primary issue of concern is, be it the environment, you know, be it be it youth issues, media should be your second issue, right? And to the extent that you can bring all of these movements together to fight for, for media reform, we're going to be strengthening, strengthening everybody's work and serving everybody's needs. So um, anyway, I'm going to turn it over to Jason and stop rambling. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> um, I... Uh, I'm really excited to hear what what Jason has to say, and then to hear from all of to hear from all of you um, about what issues are what you know what challenges you are facing in Boston, and what you all feel the kind of primary uh, problems are that need to be addressed in the Boston area, and maybe see how we can work together to to try to fix some of those problems. So. Thanks, Libby. Um, ironically, you you and a few other people here who were at our, at our pre-event at the Charles Hotel have heard the substance of my <laughs> remarks today. This is a truncated version of a talk I gave, uh, you know, to build up for the conference. And it's like it's not like the issues really changed. So I figured I'd just take that section and uh, and uh, speak it here. Um, so I'm Jason Pramus. I'm the editor and publisher of Open Media Boston, and we're an online nonprofit community news weekly with a progressive editorial policy serving Boston and environs. We focus our coverage on the labor and nonprofit sectors, although we are a general interest publication. We've been publishing since March 20th, 2008, so we just celebrated our third anniversary. Now, some background. Um, I know we, <laughs> and many more. Um, so, okay, Boston is a major media hub. But we haven't had a significant media reform network operating here since Boston Media Action folded tents in 1992. There have been some serious attempts at creating one in the past two decades, but nothing's really gotten off the ground. The result has been that the voices of many of Boston's communities have been largely missing from the debates on a host of critical issues over this period. And it should go without saying that the communities in question are the ones that pay the highest price <clears throat> for corporate-backed initiatives uh, like digital TV transition and structural problems like the digital divide. Or as our co-speaker said at the Charles Hotel, Nolan Bowie said digital divides, which I think was a good way of putting it. Now let me discuss why media reform is critical and why I think we need to found a Boston media reform network as soon as possible. First, if one starts from the position that media plays a critical role in the maintenance of a democratic society at all levels, then it stands to reason that allowing private interests to dominate the production and dissemination of information necessary to allow for an informed populace is antithetical to democracy, most especially multinational corporations and certain political and religious interests. Second, if that's the case, then it's highly problematic that key corporations and political interests have succeeded in weakening and ultimately eliminating legal and regulatory regimes aimed at protecting the public's right to good media. And for those of us who are media producers, the public, you know, the media's right to an audience, I guess you'd say. Over the last 30 years, we've seen the unfortunate results of this process. We've lost important telecommunication reforms of earlier generations, like the Fairness Doctrine. We've watched flawed but fairly decent laws like the Communications Act of 1934 amended and the Copyright Act of 1976 be updated at the behest of the telecommunications industry, various internet corporations, and conservative groups into new bastardized versions like the Telecommunications Act of 1996 and the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Broadly speaking, these defeats have allowed the extreme concentration of the ownership of corporate media, a similar concentration of web-based media, unfortunately, which kind of belies all the long tail stuff you may have heard about, and a great reduction in the number and diversity of voices featured on said media. In addition, we've seen the original intent of the Carnegie Commission 1967 report on educational television and the Public Broadcasting Act of 1967 that grew out of it, beaten back by the right wing almost since its inception to the point where conservatives in Congress working hard, um, are working hard to completely wipe out all public funding for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting as we speak. 
and thus severely weaken the already weakened public broadcasting networks, PBS and NPR, and other publicly funded media entities like Public Radio International, Independent Television Service, and Pacifica. This is certainly a drag, since I believe we should be going in the opposite direction, as I imagine many of you do as well, an expanded public media system that would fund, among other things, the new wave of community media outlets like Open Media Boston, and a host of other media too. Now we have this page journey issue. It's the problem with reading these things. These dangerous moves are very far away from the, what the Carnegie Commission called for in their 1967 report. They said that, the public, uh, that public broadcasting should, quote, provide a voice for groups in the community that may otherwise be unheard, serve as a forum for controversy and debate, and broadcast programs that help us see America whole in all its diversity. Instead of a public media that's running in the broad interest of all sectors of society, we're moving to a system where I fear that virtually all significant media will be almost totally corporate dominated at some point in the near future, especially news media, which I believe will be reduced to little more than warmed over corporate PR transcription within a decade or so. There are many other issues I could mention that any good regional media reform organization will also have to grapple with, including the defense of PEG access, which many of you know as cable access, and the need for public broadband, municipal Wi-Fi, and as of yesterday, net neutrality once again, all of which will tend to help preserve democracy and wipe out the digital divides. But my main point here is that Boston can no longer allow attacks on the public's right to a diverse and vibrant media to pass unchallenged. Other cities like Seattle and San Francisco and Hawaii, you know, not a city but a state, have vibrant media reform groups that work with national media reform groups like Free Press. So I think it's time we get the ball rolling here. And we call this roundtable to do that. So now let's talk. Now, before we talk, just a couple of you know, housekeeping issues. Um, first of all, lists. Uh, some of you may have signed a list we had yesterday in the Boston caucus. If you think you did, you know, then don't sign it again. But otherwise, please sign in, because we want to keep in touch with folks, obviously. And uh, it's important to do that up front. Second, um, we uh, need a note taker. Uh, if someone's willing to just take notes and uh, email us you know, the results, I know no one really wants to do this. And I know it's almost certainly that like, a woman's going to be the first one to volunteer. If a guy could do it, that would be nice. But if somebody could do it, we could really use that help. So can anybody um, suck that one up, take some notes, just decision, you know, sort of, yeah, okay, that would be great. Thanks. And um, s the other things are, um, I want to say up front, because I know some of you have to leave, that um, Open Media Boston, Mass Global Action, and the Organized Collaborative are going to be doing a fall conference. Um, the second in a, di uh, we did a digital media conference in 2009, and this will be uh, this, this one for 2011 in the fall. Uh, social movements and digital revolutions, which will be at um, Lesley University. So I want to just pass these out um, before I forget so people can see this. And uh, should we try to do a go-around? I know it's risky because it might take a while. What do you think? Uh, no? The, the vote is no. Although <laughs> I, I would really like to just get a sense of how many people here are with community media, like producing, like who's from who's from a cable access or a PEG channel? If you're willing to have that discipline, I'd say yes. <laughs> but how long, that would take probably three minutes. Just don't say anything other than the name. In this case, if people can pass the mic from hand to hand really fast and do it, starting with Wayne, then do it. <laughs> I, I'd really like to know. All right. Speak. Wayne Clark, <coughs> and I'm with Open Media Cooperative. Which is our business wing. Uh, Carly Maltese, and I am with Open Media Boston uh, and Co op. <laughs> I'm Linda Pinkow, and I'm with WMBR Radio at MIT. Hi, I'm Dana Moser. I don't really have an affiliation. <laughs> Amy Grunder, unaffiliated lawyer and writer. Andrew McLeod, Open Media Boston Cooperative. Shara Drew, Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood. Uh, Tom Clammer with KKFI Community Radio in Kansas City, Missouri. Tom Crane from uh, Friends of Community Media in Kansas City and KKFI Radio in Kansas City. Chris Lovett, BNN TV, uh, cable TV, me, internet. Alan Becker, citizen. <laughs> uh, Mike Fogelberg, uh, political activist. Saul Tannenbaum, neighbor media, um, CCTV Cambridge. James Marone, unaffiliated. 
I'm Charlie McInerney, uh, media marketer. Kathleen Pierce, freelance writer, blogger. Marilyn Ingalls, representing myself. Doug Anderson, freelance radio producer in Boston. So we have a lot of lawyers, I can tell. <laughs> Eli Beckerman, Massachusetts Coalition for Healthy Communities and Encuentro Cinco. Bill Mitchell, Pointer Institute. It's a school for journalists in Florida. Monique Nguyen, um, unaffiliated web designer. Suren Mudlia, non-citizen. <laughs> uh, Christine O'Connell, looking for an affiliation. Tom Louis, a Progressive Communicators Network Boston chapter. Dave Ribeiro, student immigrant movement. Jennifer Mazur, Somerville Climate Action. Shirley Kressel, um, activist and uh, a columnist for South End News in Boston. Bill Densmore with the New England News Forum. Liz Pelly, Boston Phoenix. Uh, Brian Whalen, um, uh, Newspaper Guild Local 30, 31032. I also work for the Herald. Damien O'Brien, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, would be media activist, fledgling media, <laughs> media activist. Joni Ciani, uh, New England Institute of Art and um, media literacy professor, interpersonal communication professor, uh, WBZ Radio. Kevin Ryan, Denver, uh, Open Media Project, nothing to do with Boston oh, Open no, Media. Yeah, Alyssa yeah. <laughs> uh, Greenberg, um, The Sampan, which is a bilingual Chinese-English newspaper out of Chinatown, and also WBUR. Wendy Blum, Somerville Community Access Television. Peter Miller, Open Media Boston and Brookline Access TV. Uh, Christy Riley, I'm from here, uh, freelance writer and editor. N Would you be so kind as to pass the mic uh, to up, up towards the front, back in this direction? Or Carly, yeah, would you grab it? There's two mics, so we can have one on that side and, and one um, on that side. And Carly, Chris uh, here just walked in. I'd like for him to have a chance to say who he is. Hi, my name is Chris Connie Bear, and actually there's a Massachusetts connection. I'm from Honolulu, but it was the... Uh, it, it was the missionaries from Massachusetts that colonized Hawaii. So. It's so true. <laughs> we, we do apologize. Okay. And, and Chris, Chris is from Media Council Hawaii. Media Council Hawaii. A <laughs> uh, couple new entrants, if you want to grab them, and then we'll just, uh, I'll just mention the ideas. Your name and affiliation? I'm Simone Rios, a colleague of Jason, Open Media Boston, freelance reporter, Nashua, New Hampshire. Uh, Liana Poston, um, I work for the city of Boston. And Annie. I'm Annie Shuffler. I am the Boston Action Okay, um, so just quickly, I mean, uh, what we're looking for is like, and we said this, I think, in the summation in the, in the program, you know, how do you envision this kind of network, you know, and, and what, um, what are the critical issues that you think such a network would, would, would work on? I mean, I mentioned some, right, broad ones, but what do you, what do you think? Um, you know, we're not talking structure or any of that pain in the ass stuff we're gonna have to deal with in the months to come, but you know, we're talking like, what are we doing? So who, who's got some thoughts? Um, I don't know how, how directly I, I can answer that. Um, we've been trying to do some media reform in Kansas City for a number of years, uh, more or less since uh, the, the first media conference in Madison in 2003. We had a bunch of enthusiasm that has seemed to peter out. So I guess I would just like to see, to be in communication with other groups, hear about what they've tried that works, uh, hear about what they've tried that hasn't worked uh, and what they've learned from it and just get ideas on how to make something work in Kansas City. Um, I'm, I live in Boston. Um, I, I just think, well, content. 
the uh, the the real stories just are on a web page somewhere. You know, if you find it, you're lucky. If you're on a listserv, you read it. Um, but you know, it it just seems like there needs to be. We need to find good content, and we need to be able to distribute it more widely. That's what I think. Um, beyond content, I need to. I think we need to have a better connection and a dialogue with uh, the communities, especially in the urban areas, and uh, affect the communities, communities of color, because that um, we've had uh, some small attempts in Boston, Boston area to form coalitions, uh, including uh, the Boston Action Tank, uh, Agni Boston, and so forth. But um, but we've because of lack of resources, and in the case of Agni Boston. Um, they work primarily with uh, cable access uh, uh, media groups uh, in the greater Boston, mostly suburban suburban programs. The only connection I think is with BNN in, in, in the city, Boston Neighborhood uh, Network. And but the seldom when I went to some of those meetings, I see communities of color, you know, in in the room or uh, in in Boston per se, other than the, the BNN network. So I think that we need to start a dialogue, you know. And, and meetings with community groups who work with uh, those communities, and uh, and 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 also to get not only feedback from them, uh, and and also talk about what is relevant to them in connection with some of the policies uh, in in uh, you know in uh, in the country. Let me say that um, this is not a preliminary organizing meeting. This is you know you know we're, we're like listening and you know want to get people involved in the effort, and we want to get you know, the, the, quote unquote, the right people in the room, the right organizations in the room, as many as we can find from around the city for a, a preliminary meeting in May. So that's what we're shooting at, so you all know. How do we feel about just passing the mic from person to person? We feel that it's gonna take too long. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, who's next? You can talk too, though. I mean, it's not, we're not gonna sit too long. Um, so I think one thing that would be sort of fun in raising awareness, because I think a lot of people watch local news, like my grandmother, for instance, and say, what's the problem? This is great. Um, so as a way of raising awareness of just how much junk there is on our local news to sort of have like a hall of shame that people could have access to, you know, if we catch something that's particularly troubling um, on local news to sort of have some interactive site where we can either upload a clip or um, just write a brief description. Here's the channel it was on, here's the time, he, you know, here's why it was so awful. Um, and I think that might be a great way to raise awareness because I know if I saw something like that on, on a website, I might be willing to share it with my grandmother and say, see, this was really awful last night and this is why we need the kinds of changes that we all know that we need. I just wanna jump in uh, really fast and uh, let you know that um, Free Press actually has sort of a national version of that. It's a, a, a called Media Fail, mediafail.com. <laughs> and uh, any, anyone can, can uh, post their own media fail to that site. It's not super active. I would love to see more people using it. Um, but it's, it, it's really great. You can, you know, you post the fail, you post the media outlet responsible and the link to the, to the video or the story and then people can fail it. You know, and so it, it can accumulate fails, um, and then they get kind of ranked, and the the best ones rise to the top. And so, uh, it, it, it's pretty fun. It, it, you could easily set up a local version as well, or just use mediafail.com if you wanted to. Uh, did Did you have? Uh, Got a hand here. We had. Who has the microphone? Okay. <laughs> well, since we're all here, I don't have to talk about the importance of media reform. I think we all understand why. Um, but I think whatever cause you're working on, part of my background has been as a community organizer, and I think you can have um, one part of it you need is passion and motivation, but you need organization. Um, you can bring people together with the greatest ideas, but how do you move forward and build a movement. And part of that is, you know, something I beat a drum about a lot, which is um, effective community organizing. You know, because you bring volunteers together, um, you want to maximize their time and value their time. So that being said, 
this is something that I think I've been thinking a lot about for a few years. And um, one of the things that you mentioned was coalition building. Yeah. Um, and it's, especially in Boston, I think it's very hard for a variety of reasons. I think we have um, a parochial attitude, territorialism, ego, revenge. Um, seriously, there's a lot of that on, on the radar in Boston. And so as you move forward, I think keeping that in mind and finding what, what, what is the interest of other groups, what, what, what can you bring to the table for them as part of a coalition building process. And then the question is, where do you go? I mean, this, this is a conference on reform. So I've looked at it from two ways. One is reforming current media content or creating new venues for media content. And by current media content, it could be something like a local fairness doctrine. It could be something like demanding that the Boston Globe and the Boston Herald have an environmental section in their newspaper. Um, it could be demanding a more, perhaps, open political discussion and debate on BNN, which, which is an infrastructure in place, but the question is, is it doing enough? Could it do more? So those are examples of reforming current content. And creating new, new media venues is part of the exciting piece I see because we can get information about what's going on in Libya and Iran, but we can't find sometimes what information is across the street. And I think part of the technological development and the, the knowledge that we have I think that, that it could be more than just media. I think it can be um, a, a, a one-stop shopping for, for information about your community. So you can imagine going to a website where you might be able to get the minutes of a, of a group that met five years ago about an issue and see that they've already covered this stuff. It's already there. We don't need to you know, rehash it. This is, this is where we are and where we need to go. Um, getting data, getting information, getting the, city's Boston's, the city of Boston's budget online in a digital format. That's a radical concept, believe it or not. It's not accessible. Um, so there are, there's a myriad of, of opportunities to create networks, to, to download information that can be accessible to everybody. And lastly, um, I like what this brother said about bringing different parts of the city together. I mean, you've got like community radio in Roxbury, Magic. They're struggling to, 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 to broadcast to you know a one or two mile radius. Fenway News is a monthly, that could be a weekly. So what I see is a lot of local community activists doing work in multimedia and print who are alone or isolated. And I think trying to find common ground where we can move together with a, a multi-point agenda that, that can support everybody um, might also be part of the, the solution. For the benefit of our out-of-town guests, if folks could, um, you know, <coughs> say out what acronyms are, like BNN, it's Boston Neighborhood Network, it's Boston's Cable Access Network. Um, uh, I just wanted to say that at Somerville Community Access Television, we just started a new internet radio station called Boston Free Radio, and it really is not Somerville. It's open to everybody in Massachusetts, and it's a free speech venue. And it would be fabulous if we could have a media reform program on our channel. Um, anybody can go there, bostonfreeradio.com. Just started in January, but we're accepting DJs and they can do whatever they want. We have rights to all the music people play. Um, so it's really a, a great starting out venture. bostonfreeradio.com. Hi, one of the things that I'd, I'd like to see, and I think it's kind of jumping on that point of a media reform program, um, just the way that Greater Boston, that television show on GBH, where you get media people coming together to talk about the media, to have a similar thing that was a grassroots version of that, so it's not, you know, in some, some level, it's like it's gatekeepers talking about themselves. Um, where we could recreate that and talk about Boston media reform, community media, and to have it span so that it is um, taking advantage of Cambridge Community Television, Somerville Community Access Television, BNN, and the rest of it, so that we were talking across the river, across um, racial divides, and, and all of it. I'd like to know where are the opportunities for new media content. 
uh, w um, who has a uh, sort of room or where the opportunities are, where there are points of intersection for the creation of new kinds of programming um, that would be um, progressive or in line with our politics. Sort of following up on the last two remarks, uh, the one way in which the um, dominant media has been uh, really interesting and uh, in some ways subversive of broader social change is the, the effective way in which they've undermined or blurred the lines between, um, say, military elites and, and, and the making of news or business elites and the making of news so that these people end up as informed uh, uh, experts on the topic a and setting the news agenda, what I'd really be interested in seeing is to what extent we can reproduce that in the other direction. I think Open Media Boston does an interesting job by by, let by letting people identify themselves as advocates, et cetera, when, th when they post news. But I'd like, uh, like to see us proactively reaching out to the media makers within the grassroots organizations uh, along the lines, I think, that uh, T Tom Louis meant when he talked about the Boston Action Tank and other kinds of things like that. So uh, building that kind of a network that brings in the expertise of the of grassroots uh, newsmakers would be something interesting for me. I'm hearing a lot of questions or comments uh, regar relating to sort of community media outlets, new media outlets, citizen journalism, community <coughs> journalism. I, I'm wondering sort of about the, the rest of the Boston media landscape, and I, I'm not from Boston, so, so I'm unfamiliar, but, but what are some of the, the challenges or some of the problems with, you know, with uh, your local broadcast TV? How are your uh, NPR and your PBS stations faring, um, especially, you know, uh, given the defunding um, attempts that are that are going on in the House right now, um, and what what about internet access and, um, and openness in Boston? Are are people thinking about any of these issues? Did you have a, a, something to say? Um, can we? Where, Carly? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, and then. Like I said, I'm associated with WBUR, so that's a local NPR affiliate. Um, we're very lucky to be one of the largest um, of affiliates in, of NPR all over the country, extremely well-loved, and I would say we just finished um, a fundraising effort where we raised the most money we have ever raised in a fundraising effort, and so the answer is people are really upset about this prospect of defunding and um, are showing it by uh, through through their wallets, um, which is great for us. But I mean, we were never one of the ones that was going to be in danger. Um, when in term when you talk about defunding NPR, the problems are the small affiliates way, um, that rely on the larger um, the larger affiliates' money and uh, public money. Um, so. Here, here it's not a problem, but of course we're all aware that it's a larger problem nationally. I was just gonna, I, I was just noticing as I listen to people around the room that basically what I'm hearing is um, people are talking about kind of two areas. Obviously one is reforming the media that is currently dominant and the other one is creating, supporting, and building connections between the alternative media that exists. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe that's a good sort of, I mean, those are two different things, right? So it would seem that when organizing to do something, you sort of put yourself in one box or the other. And I was just thinking, um, one thing that I'd be really interested in, you know, I don't, I'm, um, I'm a neophyte in terms, of a, in, in terms of this particular kind of organizing about the media specifically. And I'd be interested in, um, Having having a definition of what the media landscape already is in Boston, and what are the problems with that? That's one thing I'm really interested in. You know, defining, and that that sort of goes to the reform piece. Um, and then the other piece is, um, it looks I'd be interested in sort of identifying alternative creators of content in Boston. You know, whether those are 
organizations or people or blogs or whatever they are. There was a really interesting um, s um, session this morning. I don't know if some of the people were there at um, where there were people from, there was someone from Mother Jones talking about how they were able, how like somebody from Mother Jones posted something about um, the language in um, GOP proposed legislation about redefining rape and just did a little post and then some blogger got a hold of it like on a Friday night <laughs> and by Monday it was viral, all the pro-choice organizations had picked up on it and that's sort of like <coughs> a really interesting, to me that's a really interesting thing um, to think about because that was original content but then it really depended on alternative media participants to, to make it into a movement. Okay, I'll shut up. It sounds like you're no. It sounds like you're talking about you know the need for some community mapping of some mm -hmm. kind to really to really be able to identify strengths and weaknesses within the Boston area, uh, and then this gentleman here had his hand up as well, and then the gentleman in the in the back in the blue as well. Um, seems like the problems of organizing here locally are pretty similar to what's going on around the rest of the country and. Um, like to know some ideas on how we can engage a larger community in, uh, in reforming their own media, which gets down to the idea of fundraising because you need to raise some funds to do this media reform. And um, it might be useful if we could share some of those ideas with each other on what kind of activities have <coughs> fostered the groups that you're in and help us to get the funds we need to produce materials that will help educate the public. Um, and, and just to jump jump in on that, um, you kind of the, these last two comments um, piggybacking on each other reminded me of a really important kind of bridge between uh, c the need to sort of support community media and, and the policy work. Um, I don't I don't know probably how many of you in the room have heard of the PTFP the federal PTFP grant community radio folks, okay? So <laughs> this is a really little known program, um, but what it was was basically the only capital grant out there for uh, community radio stations to get on the air. And they w it was a, it's a matching <coughs> grant. You could get up to 75% of your capital funds to create a new community radio station from this federal program housed under the NTIA. Um, and it was hugely important for small community groups trying to create new media outlets. Well, Obama's budget for next year put it on the chopping block, and the continuing resolution that um, that was just passed, you know, to, to keep to keep the government going, zeroed out the PTFP program's funding for the remainder of this year. Uh, so PTFP is in all likelihood not going to come back, and there are about 30 community organizations that currently have construction permits for new community radio stations. Many of them are, are native organizations and they have just lost their primary source of capital funding for getting on the air. So I just want to kind of underscore the, the connection and the importance of working on the federal level and working on, on policy and keeping your eye on what's going on in, in Congress and the really direct and and devastating impact that failure to do so can can have on the, on your local community. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and then. Hello. All right. Oh. I have kind of a it's a novice question, I guess, because I'm a newcomer to this whole scene. Um, but how is it that we can get a place to? know what is going on because there's so many outlets out there you know in Boston alone there's you know it's hundreds of different media outlets and then you have the large outlets that cover all of the region all of New England or the, the entire country so it goes on to the question about mapping what is going on is there a central place for all of these is there a way to combine everything is there a way to have somewhere we can all go that is very uh, reliable you know and that's kind of a question to everybody and I don't I don't know how we could get there uh, th this gentleman <laughs> in the f in the front had his hand up, and then and you in the back for you were waiting longer. Go ahead, you have the mic. Um, sort of two separate comments. First, to your question about broadband access. I mean, both the municipal governments of Boston and Cambridge 
you know, have adopted that as some sort of issue in the in the past month or two, and we all should get behind that because that's, you know, both Boston and Cambridge have, you know, broadband monopolies, and you know, municipal pressure is the only way to to deal with that. Um, secondly, in terms of the state of um, the Boston media, there was a session on that <coughs> nine o'clock yesterday morning, and it was extraordinarily entertaining and very very sad. Um, because there was very little about, you know, growing the audience, except in terms of, you know, will the Boston Globe paywall, you know, save it or kill it? Um, and there was a lot of, you know, sniping between, you know, BUR and GBH about, you know, you stole our format and you're stealing our listeners, et cetera. Um, I, I was, I I, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I, you know, it, it, it was immensely entertaining, um, but completely irrelevant. Prof oh. No, I was just pointing to the next person in line. Carly, this gentleman in the front. For folks that came in late, we, you know, we're asking folks to, you know, say what they think are the critical issues that a, that a media reform network in the Boston area could work on, and that includes policy stuff, which we haven't heard too much about yet. So, in addition to helping start the New England News Forum. I'm part of something called Journalism That Matters. And since our JTM event in <coughs> Seattle a year ago, January, there's been a very vibrant ongoing process that's gotten started in Seattle that's culminating in something called the Puget Sound <coughs> uh, Community News Commons. I think it's something like that. It might be really interesting to get somebody from that sort of effort to come here, either just Skype here or come here and talk about what's going on in the Seattle area because I think the parallels to Boston could be quite interesting. So I'm from outside Boston most of the time, but uh, I now spend about two weeks a month here in a hotel, so I'm kind of living here. Um, so I also do work for Brookline, BNN, Easton, Amherst uh, community television stations. The good news is all these organizations are, are standardizing on open source solutions that people are talking about downstairs right now. Uh, and there's commonality in the markup, the metadata, making all of this very searchable, thanks in large part to WGBH, who manages that metadata dictionary, the PB Core dictionary. So the bad news is uh, these organizations typically, even within public access, don't have a lot of interest in recognizing that they're all using the mm -hmm. same software and doing the same thing. Uh, so even though technically you could make a lot of this stuff searchable, easier to find uh, and interact, move content between systems much easier, the politics involved in, in getting these organizations to work together are, are just overwhelming. Yeah, Tom, Tom, and then the gentleman in the in the blue jacket in the rear. Yeah, and and again, I'm from Kansas City. I'm not from Boston, and I'm very interested in uh, local things and don't want to, uh, uh, you know, underplay the importance of that. But you know, when you read McChesney, when when you read uh, the the book they gave out free, the I just skimmed through it, read the, the chapter near the end by uh, Free Press President Craig Aaron, and I just spoke with him earlier today. Um, I really believe what uh, McChesney and Nichols say, that journalism in this country is in a huge uh, existential crisis, and that means that democracy is in an existential crisis. And so while I, I very interested in, in the local in Kansas City, and I think people in Boston should be interested in the local in Boston. I'm also interested in ways, you know, you mentioned the PTF. P. P yeah, the <laughs> PTFP. That's, uh, Tom tells me how we originally got our equipment 20 years ago. We're a 100,000 watt <coughs> FM community radio station with probably a, a 5,000 watt audience because people haven't heard of us. but. We don't take ourselves seriously sometimes. We get out great local and national information on shows like Democracy Now. Not enough people are hearing it. Too many of us, even uh, the, the fans and participants of this, I don't think take ourselves seriously enough. Craig Aaron said last night he's not 
you know, paraphrasing, he's not uh, uh, in this to fight the good fight for the sake of fighting the, the good fight. He's in it to win it. I think democracy is imperiled, and we can do something about it. I don't know that it's likely, but it is possible, and I think uh, taking ourselves seriously and finding ways to do our local things, but also uh, join together somehow to impact these uh, uh, national issues as, as well should be a, a priority. The question I have is if we were in control, what would be different? Um, and if we can't lay out what the difference would be then what's the point of being here? Um, I think the issue of uh, democracy is a, a critical one, but the fact of the matter is uh, some of the handhelds have done an incredible job of uh, getting stories out that would not have gotten out if we had to wait for the, the media, the, um, the money media, uh, to do so. So uh, I think it's an imperative to understand so that people would join something that we know, they know, is different and has much more going for them than what they're being fed at the moment. The other piece I think about is how we got uh, Say Brother and how we got people both in front and back of the camera, um, you know, 25, 30 years ago, because we understood that the FCC had this question about local origination and whether or not the particular media channels were, in fact, doing things that were related to what people wanted in the community, and that they had to, every so many years, come before the FCC and show what they were doing in the community. And so, fortunately, um, you know, Bill Russell was the big person in the city at the point. And so, working with him, we got channels uh, four, five, seven to both hire folks and to do some programming. And then we took on channel two, public broadcast. We had to take them on in order to get programs for black, Latino, Asian to be on there. So what level of political activity do we get into, the second level, which says that we own those stations. As a public, we ought to think about our right to those stations and to the airwaves and that those folks have to be accountable to us. And if we don't feel that, then I'm not sure what will be different about what we do. Uh, thank you very much for, for those comments. I think that's that's really important. And I think this is kind of a, g a good moment maybe to, to shift the conversation a little bit towards talking about some of these uh, solutions and, and, and mechanisms for change that, that can, can get us from, from A to B. And, and to your question of, you know, what will be different, I think it, it is really um, – key as well, but um, I, I, I want to just give a little bit more information about what you were, what you were talking about, of, of the, the license renewal process for TV and radio stations. You know, it, it used to be a much more accountable process, and it's really been watered down and become this, this rubber stamp process. You know, the, these companies are using the public airwaves for free, as I'm sure most of you are aware, and they have a p an obligation to serve the public interest. That's the deal that they make <coughs> with with the public via via the, the federal government to, to use those airwaves that they will serve the public interest. And um, yet, there's no accountability at this point in time. They get a little postcard in the mail, they fill it out, they send it back, they get their station for another eight years. Now, there is actually a, a process for challenging those license renewals, um, which come up every eight years. And actually, I have this media reform action guide that Free Press puts out. I I'm regret that I did not bring a whole 
box of them to the session, but they they are available at the Free Press booth in the exhibit hall. And we'll have them for May, right? <laughs> oh yes, and I'll make sure you get them for your for your next meeting, um, <laughs> your first meeting. But uh, th this action guide contains a, a bunch of tools, te tips, and techniques for promoting uh, change and, and media reform locally and nationally, and it. Um, I, there's information in here about how to ch challenge the license renewal for your local uh, TV or radio station. Now in Massachusetts, you have a few years to organize around this if this is a strategy that you decide to take on. Your radio stations uh, come up for renewal in April of 2014 and your TV stations in uh, April of 2015. <laughs> so you have a few, a, a few years if that's a strategy that, that you think you want to employ. And I know this is something that Commissioner Copps is also very interested in changing in his remaining year at the FCC to, um, to make sure that these stations are once again accountable and that there's a mechanism for, for community input as to whether these stations are meeting the needs of the community. Um, Chris, I, I don't know if I'd be putting you on the spot, but um, Chris Connie Bear is here from Media Council Hawaii, which is one of the oldest local media reform organizations in the country, and I thought maybe it would be um, uh, useful for people in the room to hear a little from you about Media Council Hawaii and, and the work that you do and uh, how you got organized. Can we get a microphone over to Chris? Raise your hand. So, um, Media Council Hawaii has been in existence for 30 some years in one way or another. And like many grassroots and community organizations, some years we're really going gangbusters and other years we're almost out of business and some years we have some victories and some years we don't, but we keep at it. Uh, the principle, taking into account everything, and you all know this, you think global and act local. So you have to take, you have to pay attention to what's happening internationally and in Washington, D.C. All, we all support community television. The next telecom act could cut out funding for community television altogether. Because right now it was the 96 act which says PEG access has to get a certain percentage, or not even PEG access, but that they can charge up to 5% of franchise uh, money for a local community, and many communities devote that to PEG access. That can change. Congress can change that, can wipe out funding for community television. Um, we have FCC rules about localism, diversity, and competition. They don't enforce them. So somebody needs to start thinking about that. Our, <clears throat> our organization did not try to build a coalition of all the groups. What we did was, the principle is, no matter what your issue is, the media is, should be number two. If your issue is uh, gender related, if your issue is environment related, if your issue is about the economy, the second thing you should be worried about is media. How do you get your issue, information about it, to the public? So. With those principles, we have kind of gone down this track, sometimes veering this way and that way, and sometimes almost stopping. Um, <clears throat> the other thing to think about is that the latest Pew study just came out. Sixty-some percent of the entire American public says they get their primary information from local broadcast television. They don't get it from the Internet. They don't get it from other sources. We wish they would get it from other sources. But the fact of the matter is, they get it from local broadcast television. So it's very important for the community to find ways to influence the information that appears via local broadcast television. So one of our things was to get people involved with simply focusing on some of the rules. All broadcast outlets are supposed to have a public file. Very simple thing, you get two or three people, it's supposed to be available anytime during business hours, you're supposed to be able to look at it, and there's all kinds of information there. Very simple thing to get three or four people to go from different organizations and find out, well, sometimes they don't have it available, sometimes it's not complete, and sometimes they don't even know where it is. It gets people involved. 
we took on uh, an illegal merger in our market three years ago and filed an actual complaint at the FCC. They haven't done anything yet. Despite all the rhetoric, despite Commissioner Kopp's good intention, the FCC has not acted on a very clear situation violating their rules. And yet, our community has responded. So we find some of these issues that resonate with different organizations. So our organization has representatives from Common Cause, from Native Hawaiian organizations, has representatives of, of the uh, lesbian, gay, transgender community. We have, you know, that kind of representation. We have journalists, non-journalists, et cetera. We also deal with other issues. We, we, we discovered, and it's the Knight Ritter Foundation discovered that high school students think the language of the First Amendment goes too far. They have no idea what it is. So we have, just in the schools, we have a Freedom of Expression First Amendment Education Project, and we've brought that to 1,000 students in the last couple of years. Um, we have looked at other policy issues that affect the local community, and we try to get people involved. It's very, you know, and sometimes we are successful. We were successful in getting a state shield law passed that protects journalist sources. <coughs> um, anyway, it, it isn't easy, and you know, sometimes you feel really frustrated and you want to just say enough of this. But if you really look at what's happening at this conference and think about the importance of information to democracy, you think about the importance of the community having its own voice, and you think about those things, then you can usually find enough people to go with you and sort of take on the next task. Uh, and so that's kind of a brief history over our last, since 1970. And sometimes almost nobody shows up. And sometimes the rooms fall. And sometimes we find an issue that really resonates. But there's always a core group who sort of keeps it going and picks up the baton and keeps, keeps at it. So this is fantastic. You guys have a fantastic uh, potential beginning here. And I congratulate you. So thank you. Let me, let me just ask where our list is. And uh, for those who've just come in and haven't signed our sign-up list, please uh, go ahead and sign it. And uh, for people who just came in, again, we, we are now talking about uh, ideas for solutions and potential campaigns. Um, I feel greatly comforted that other folks are having a hard time, too, because <laughs> it's difficult. But uh, I'd like to hear what some of the local groups have done that have been successful and give you a couple things that we did. We uh, gave out a media award, we had a media awards event where we brought in a national speaker and gave out awards to the people that were uh, helping the progressive community in the media. And then we had a golden plunger award, which we would give to those that were not too good. <laughs> and we did a media re for us reform week, uh, media education seminars around the city. And uh, we had sparse attendance at some events and good attendance at others. And this year we're gonna be hosting the uh, grassroots radio conference. So, but I sure would like to hear what the local Boston folks are doing. Um, grassrootsradioconference.org, coming in <laughs> August to Kansas City, check it out. It's a great conference. The Grassroots Radio Conference. Go ahead, yes. Uh, who has the mic? <laughs> <laughs> well, as far as solutions go, it seems to me that if we think the local news should reflect what the community wants it to reflect, then we need some sort of tool for finding out what people in the greater Boston community think the news should be about, um, which I think might be technically pretty easy, and the, the tough part would be publicizing it, obviously, and. Um, figuring out how to analyze that information, but it might be uh, one, one thing to set up. Do others have ideas for? Sure, uh, uh, Tom, and, Tom first and then, and then Chris. Yeah, I, 
I don't know about the tools to find out what they want, but you talked earlier about uh, uh, critiquing what you didn't like. Um, I don't. I hope most of you are familiar with fairness and accuracy in reporting and their radio show Counterspin. I think every city ought to have a, a local radio show mo modeled on Counterspin, doing an, uh, a thoughtful and 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 almost scholarly analysis of uh, news coverage, what works and doesn't work, and ginning up some uh, response when there's something that uh, needs to be criticized. And it uh, uh, Counterspin has shown that that does work with some of their critiques of NPR and, and other outlets, New York Times and so forth. So I think every city ought to try and do something like that. One idea that we have started working on that has scared the hell out of the media owners is we're talking about made, trying to organize a community ownership of a local commercial license. Much like the people of Green Bay organized to purchase the Green Bay Packers when there was a threat of foreign ownership. So we're thinking something like, and who knows, I mean, this is a, a work in progress, every the community, everybody gets to buy a $100 share. Even if you have a, you can put a million dollars in, you get a $100 share. You put a dollar in, you get a, anyway, something like that. We raise, if we can sell 100,000 shares at 100 bucks, that's $10 million. That's enough to leverage the price of one of our television stations. What do you say community owns? What do you mean by that? Community owns a commercial license. Commercial yeah. And that way, you don't need, once you do that, you don't need to raise money every year because you're selling ads. You don't need to make 25% profit that the commercial stations make. You only need to break even or make a small profit enough to get the next level of equipment. You then own four digital channels, which are some of the robust, most robust airwave spectrum around. So you might be able to do interesting things with mobile. You might have a whole station devoted to native issues or the environment. I mean, anyway, there are a lot of possibilities. And every time we bring this up, People sort of like the idea, and the media owners hate the idea. So we think there's something to it. So it's just another, <laughs> <laughs> it's just another idea that might be something to think about. Get a microphone. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm on the board of something called Shires Media Partners in Bennington, Vermont. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that owns a commercial radio license in Bennington. Oh. So if you're interested in learning more about the easy and hard parts of doing that, and there have been some serious hard parts be happy to talk to you. And I'll put that, I'll put a reference to that in the notes. Also, there's a fellow here named Tom Stites at this conference who is organizing something called the Banyan Project, which is an effort to conduct an experiment of doing two or three cooperatively owned news organizations in various places around the country. And he's actually talking with that Fusion Sound comments that I mentioned earlier about possibly doing it in Seattle, but I think he'd love to do it in Boston because he lives in Newburyport. <laughs> so. How's that for some serendipity? Mm -hmm. uh, Saran and then the, gen <laughs> the gentleman in the... Plus, we've been working on the co-op, too, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I probably talk to him. Well, I just wanted to point out that to make a small point, which is I guess we have a similar project, Open Media Boston and the Open Media Collective. So maybe Wayne could say something. Uh, the, yeah, the Open Media Cooperative. So maybe Wayne could say something about it. Yes, this is an effort to, um, <clears throat> it's gonna, we have it pegged as a consumer cooperative, and the idea is that uh, people will uh, join and participate by adding uh, some uh, investment capital as long, as, along with uh, some subscription fees to uh, cover the costs, and we would uh, organize uh, like a cooperative to uh, make arrangements to produce journalism, uh, both on the web and ultimately we could branch out to other forms of media. Um, and uh, we're still working out the kinks with it, but we have some enthusiasm uh, for the project and we have made some progress. And hopefully as uh, the year goes along, we can make uh, more progress and uh, really get something going. Uh, we haven't opened the um, the, the doors of the business yet, but we're getting close. And um, I think it c could turn out to be a, a nice model for how other organizations uh, can start media cooperatives. What's your contact info? Just briefly. 
Well, it's Open Media Boston. I, it's it's our project. We're, we're it's um, yeah, OpenMediaBoston.org, and the cooperative has a website, but we haven't launched it yet. Um, our hope is that in addition to our nonprofit wing that already exists, uh, that we'll be able to avail ourselves of a different funding stream by having a cooperative, plus get much more community input. Uh, the gentleman in the back. And then Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> sometimes things are right under your nose. My name is Jeff Santos. I'm the president and CEO and also the morning host of the largest independent progressive talk station in the country in terms of wattage, 50,000 watts. We get from Brockton up to the border of Maine and west to Worcester. And we have the opportunity to do with our small investment team, we lease the station, we have access 24 seven to do a lot if people come together. I'll leave my contact information here. But we work very closely with the political community. We work very closely with the journalism community from the Boston Phoenix to the Boston Globe, from Governor Patrick to Barney Frank. So what we would love to do <coughs> is to be engaged with all of you here. I mean, I'm very much willing to sort of set up a program devoted to just people coming in. We have a gentleman named Marvin Clark who writes for the Bay State Banner who will be debuting his um, commentaries from the African American perspective uh, over the coming weeks. We're trying to do the same thing with friends from the El Planeta and we have uh, <coughs> alliances with the Boston Phoenix and so forth. So I just want to make everybody aware of it, 1510 on your dial, right of the dial, left on the political spectrum. <laughs> And we would love to talk to you. We, we work very closely. We're in the, some of the communities that you know, a lot of us live in on a weekly basis. We're going to be in Somerville at the uh, Crate Place on Thursday doing the morning show. We were here yesterday morning at the uh, conference. Uh, John Nichols, who's a regular and is a, a big supporter of what we do, um, has been uh, doing promos for us. So I just wanted to make sure everybody aware. I'll leave information at the front of the door. And um, I hope you can tune in. I'm on 7 to 10 on Monday through Friday in the morning. Thanks so much. Carly, the gentleman in the blue in the back. I think as a follow-up to what you said, Santos, the kind of question I have is, what's your tool of analysis? Um, what kind of uh, survey, polling, do you do, and I guess this is for everybody, so you have some understanding of where people are at one point, and then after you have a campaign where you're getting information out, do you have a sense of how much it's impacted people, what kind of follow through do you have on that? Because so when I raise the question, you know, what would be different if we were in charge, it would seem to me that if the concern that was raised earlier about uh, democracy, and we mean democracy, we mean real participation with some uh, knowledge by the body politic, then uh, we have to ask how we are different, you know, in terms of being able to say how the information that we've given has supported people's um, change in how they see the world and what is going on. Because if we don't, then we're not much different than the major channels. Um, now, they, in collusion with um, advertisers, um, work on what brings people to listen and watch so that the amount of resource that they can get from the uh, people who want to put their ads on is based on you know, their market share of the eyes that people have. And so I'd like to get a sense of what we do that allows us to have a good analysis of how we're doing more about democracy and uh, critical information and thinking than the folks we're complaining about. No? Uh. Up here. 
I think that the idea of the broadcast television is awesome. I, I'd love to see that. The challenge, though, when you're when you're looking at for-profit advertising-driven models, is uh, the, the saying that Denver Open Media uses is that uh, if if you're not seeing ads, or if you are seeing ads, you are the product. The the audience bringing the audience to a non-profit, non-advertising-driven channel that gets its funding through alternative methods gives you a lot of freedom. And as soon as you change that that paradigm for talking from the community access point of view, it, it changes the content that you're going to be airing. It, it, what if, uh, but it, what if you charge less or don't expect as much? Like, isn't it, isn't it your owner's option? What? <coughs> because what? I'm sorry. <coughs> start taking grant money from an organization, you're going to be less critical of that organization. And as soon as you start taking ad money, it's, I'm not saying you, there isn't a balance that can't be walked, but it, it does change. If you can find a funding mechanism, like a, a lot of the sessions here have talked about not just using the peg fees, which are, which are specific to cable television for, in exchange for ripping up your streets, they're, they're giving you these channels. If you change that so that all, all, telecommunication or paying into a fund that's not just funding community television but public media with a big P and the C before it, uh, then you've, you've really changed the conversation and the media landscape. Uh, let's do Linda. She hasn't spoken yet. And that's always odd when that happens. <laughs> Well, I've just been enjoying listening to everybody and, and the vast diversity of opinions and experiences in the room is really exciting to me because usually with other media um, organizations that I've been involved with, you, you do sort of have a, a lack of diversity, which is a problem. And of course, we all know what a problem that is in Boston <coughs> historically and I, I'm sure still. Um, but when I think ahead and as we're get, getting ready to wrap this up, I suppose, um, thinking about how we plan the May meeting and subsequent meetings, I wonder how we take take advantage of the diversity and not lose it, but find a way to take all of these different perspectives that we have and different organizations that we represent and try to come up with an agenda for action. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but um, I would suggest that knowing how new organizations are formed, if we don't come up with an agenda fairly quickly, we're going to have trouble keeping people past one meeting because people want to know what we do next. Um, and I'd certainly like to hear what Mel has to say about that, <laughs> let's if he has a reaction. Let's, he hear has from, a let's hear from Mel for the last comment and then turn it over to Jason to, uh, I'm sorry I didn't see your hand back there. <laughs> I'll take one more comment. We can take one more. There's no problem. I just didn't see you. <laughs> I'm not going to make a comment on that. I think uh, it speaks for itself. What I'm interested in knowing is um, how much we're involving the uh, high school age and um, youth in all of this activity because, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, they got their handhelds. Um, they're doing lots of things with media. Um, and to the extent that we don't figure out with them, and I say with them, uh, what's in you know, the total community's interest, which is, includes them, then we're going to be having questions about the impact of the media and democracy for the next 50 years. And right now, the tools for changing that are in a lot of people's hands and not just in NBC, CBS, and all those uh, folks. They're in our hands. And so uh, there's a friend that used to say, we complain about the dirt and we got the broom in our hands. So we have to figure out with these new tools um, how we um, can use them and work in a way that can democratize, uh, give access 
uh, get stories out that are, are crucial. Okay, the woman in the red with the black blazer. Hi, my name is Catherine Russo. I'm from Provincetown, and I've been a media activist for 40 years. I've been director of <coughs> community TV stations, and uh, even though I'm way out there in Provincetown, I'm very exciting about meeting with a group in Boston. I mean, I, I, even if we don't have an agenda, just to sit in a group <coughs> like this and listen to all the projects that everybody is doing, I would come two and a half hours to do that, and I know oh, other sweet. people would too. So. Well, we're the capital, right? I, you know, I mean, we we haven't set a like uh, mile limit outside the city center. You know, it's it's the state capital. We're inevitably inevitably going to be working on state and federal legislation. So and of maybe course, come to P Town for a meeting. I'd I'm be sure. happy to come to P Town. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay, uh, the woman up front, and then uh, we'll wrap up. Unless anyone has a burning question. Yes, uh, he, well, hearing Mel King say his last comment helped me articulate something that I've, I've been hearing pieces of around the room uh, for um, how do we outreach to communities and how do we um, uh, you know, let more people on to stations and to, and I think that's what we really have to think about it as not uh, uh, the, the media and the, com and the community as sort of uh, two separate kingdoms. We have to we have to make the media part of community life so that people people find it easy to to use the, the to use the media and uh, and to, to make the media i mean the less sort of uh, you know compartmentalized and remote and centralized the media are you know to big channels and big stations and uh, things that need a lot of money uh, it, it just has to become fine-grained enough to be, to really be a part of community life, and that's how you'll know if we're we're t addressing what they care about, and that's how things will get out to people that that the mainstream media don't want to get out. It's not in the interests of the owners for it to really be news. So that's just a, a new way to think about about media as not a separate thing, but a interlaced with community life. Okay. Well, I, my mind is now a buzz, as I'm sure all of your minds are. So we're going to proceed cautiously, but with vigor over the next few months, um, because it's, it's tricky, right? You, you don't want to uh, start any kind of network or coalition on a bad foot, you know, footing, and then trip up and have people start fighting at the beginning. It's what the Taoists call in their I Ching hexagram, difficulty at beginning, right? It's a kind of a classic thing. Okay, it's it, it'll be a little messy, but it's important to muddle through because, I mean, the times we live in demand nothing less than that we, we get groups like this going and get them going all over the place. And media happens to be kind of a like an overarching, uh, you know, site of struggle, I guess you'd say. Uh, that connects to many other issues, but I mean, this is all also also has to happen for many other kind of on the ground issues that you know people involving themselves in media at every level cover. Let's say housing fights. Let's say the immigration fights. Let's you can go down the list, right? So the basic idea is that the people that have been you know the little working group we have that's been working on this so far, we're going to call a meeting. You know, I'm thinking May. May seems reasonable, uh, and that we could try to pick a date right now. Yeah, I mean, I. I I mean, but the, I'm a little hesitant because it's like either a weeknight or a Saturday, right? So it's like, um, uh, let's come back to that in a second. Let me just finish my thought, which is that we want to call the meeting. We want everybody here to go forth and multiply, essentially, right? We, you know, we want to call the meeting for, you know, somewhere in the middle of Boston, you know, ideally in, in a, one of the uh, communities most in need of media reform, that's you know well accessible to the T and has parking and stuff. You know the, the South End doesn't really have good parking, but it's it's cer certainly got parts that are accessible to the T. So we'll figure out a site, and uh, um, we want to you know be setting up the communication networks with the list we have today right away, right? So that we at least have our list serve, and that people start to talk to each other about the basic logistics and about the outreach they're doing, and um, you know then I think we need to think about how we're going to form what in my mind at least is a network because a network means that you've got this body of people who are empowered 
to um, you know come up with agendas, form working groups, and and let the working groups also go forth and multiply and do work. You know, and because we've identified already a number of sort of major areas where people think work has to happen, I, I think it's important to get the momentum going and build the structure as we go, um, or else you know we'll get we'll get stuck in internecine squabbling. Um, and we need a, we need a structure like a network that allows people to speak, that allows organizations to be represented, but also individuals. Like we have a lot of individual producers here, for example, you know, and 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 uh, and freelance writers and and other other talent. They need to be able to plug in. Organizations like, let's say, Mine, which is a media organization, or like um, well, Mel's group, the South End Technology Center, you know, need to be able to plug in as organizations. Uh, but we need to be sort of ecumenical in our approach and not say, well, it must be the only the executive directors of a group that come. We don't want to do that. So let's try to capture that energy and, and uh, yeah, let's try to figure out a date. I, I cannot do the, I think, Sunday the 22nd or something, but um, <laughs> Saturdays seem to generally work for the most people, I think. Do people agree with this if we want to try to do this right this second? Otherwise, we're going to have to do it on the listserv. Yeah, and I mean, giving ourselves five or six weeks, I think, would be good. Um, so, what was the um, the twenty first? How about the twenty first? Saturday, the twenty first, like let's say two p.m., so that people are like done with their lunch, but they can go out shopping afterwards. <laughs> we actually have to think about this. For those of you who don't do this kind of organizing, it's like crazy, but. Um, any objections to just putting that out there? May 21st at 2 p.m., site TBA. But we're going to plan to make it central. And, yeah? yeah? Of course. A fine point, and one we, sh we must now address. All right, what was the weekend before that, the 14th? I would, I would suggest. I mean, you know, I would suggest you gotta you know, pick a date and stick and stick with it. And if it, and if you want to change the date, for, I mean, I don't want to get in the middle. However, we're we're running out of time, so I just want to suggest maybe we can do the maybe you can do this over your newly formed listserv with all these these people who who attended today. Our folks. I would actually say stick with the twenty first, but we can debate about it a little more in the listserv because the the college students that are graduating and whatever kids are done already, right? In the in the colleges. The high school kids are still in school, though, and there were actually a couple of high school groups that would have been here today but just had schedule conflicts, uh, Boston Youth Organizing Project and El Movimiento. So it's not we're not forgetting that dimension, I assure you. <laughs> um, but schedule conflicts are what they are. Yeah, so, indeed. You know, let's, let's try the 21st, 2 p.m., central Boston. I just want to say thank you to everyone who, who came today, and I'm really excited that, it, you know, this new – Boston Media Reform Network is in the works. Yes, <laughs> applause for sure. And we'll circulate everything to everybody. All right. And and I'm really excited to, to collaborate with you all in, in the future. I hope you'll stay in touch with me and with Free Press, and that we can and work together to create some real change. Well, we're staying in touch. <laughs> I'm sure we are. <laughs>